Um, I'm privileged to introduce the first three present presentations by Maggie Fall, Juanisha Charles, and Piero Carlini, all of whom are in the United States. Their presentations are based on the theme of racial dimensions of language teaching and learning. Feel free to leave comments in the chat for Dr. Oda and he can respond to them um, at your leisure, at his leisure. Okay, Maggie, are you ready? Well, thank you everyone um, for having me today, Dr. Brian and everyone from Belfast. It's an honor to be here. And today, um, well, my name is Dr. Magic Fall. I'm from Kane University out in the United States in the state of New Jersey. And I'll be discussing decolonizing and democratizing language teaching and research, um, connecting philosophies, identities, and racial linguistics. Here's just a brief overview of what we will be talking about today. And so the principal issue um, at the root of my work is the tension between whiteness, racial linguistics, and identities of minoritized language groups. Um, as we already definitely know, for sure, after the Trump reign, and I call it a reign, um, the global increase of nationalistic tendencies in foreign affairs, culture and society, education, national security, and criminal justice policy has prompted contentious conversations about nationalism. Um, and issues of really uh, issues that connect um, power, identity, and privilege, and which is all based on whiteness. In our schools and classrooms, and definitely in the United States, those who do not embody whiteness in the way they see the world, including um, students who are translingual, emergent bilinguals, um, that's what I call them, um, who are often labeled English language learners, are systematically, linguistically prejudiced and racialized. And so during the Trump reign, um, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, um, popularly known as ICE, kicked down doors to catch, to jail, um, and to deport members of a Latinx community in which I conducted research um, with children of immigrants. And so after that experience, I really decided to reflect and create a better way to work with this community um, and to do research that really values who they are that considers, elevates, and legitimizes um, this group's cultural and linguistic repertoires even more so than I did before in the past. Um, and so this reflection culminated into a model of not um, only doing research, but also teaching and service. And so this model here, I um, hope you can all see it, is based on this conceptual framework, which I created around 2017, 2018, and it's designed from two lenses. Um, the first one is racial linguistics, which theorizes the connection between race and language. Um, as you know, it is primordial um, for critical scholars as myself, um, for us to acknowledge that those who are marginalized because of their linguistic identities are targeted also because of their linguistic, um, because of their ethno-racial backgrounds, right? And so this is the case of students whose maternal tongues or first languages can be Spanish in the case of many immigrant children in the United States, and also students um, across the board, really, regardless of their race and ethnicities, whose first language or second language may be African-American vernacular English. Um, secondly, this conceptual framework is based on new literacy studies, um, which reminds us that language is an ideological social practice. Um, and really, if you want to consider multiplicity of expressions and representations of language that are enacted in so many different ways of making meaning methods, we have to, we have to um, really take into consideration the underpinnings that are historical, social, cultural, political um, of uh, language. And so um, I wanted to share today in the sake of time solely the, some examples of my research work based on this model. Um, um, just think about the fact that also um, I am a teacher educator, I am a language and literacy educator, I am a very avid advocate for um, access, success, and, and, and equity for all um, types of linguistic backgrounds in our school communities. And so, you know, I will connect this work typically with my teaching because I train and coach um, pre-service and in-service teachers as part of my work. Um, and so I also take into consideration this model in my research and my um, service activities. But today we'll just focus on the scholarship side of things. Um, and so this work is anti-racist and it's anti-linguicism. 
Here's just a few types of data collection methods that I tend to use. I'd like to go into details um, on those that are connected to our students typically. And so first I'd like to discuss critical focus groups. Um, the, you know, they center around things that we read, things that we can watch, uh, things that we can listen to. And so during these conversations, I provide materials to spark critical discussions. Um, students then respond in a focus group style um, or individual, uh, individually if they prefer so, um, using things like graphic organizers, free write, or other methods of their choice. And here are some of the texts we've used before. I mean, this example, I focused at, um, that day on Latinx authors. And here's a watch it, we call it section, which revealed narratives about immigration policies, perspectives of Latinx um, groups in society, and also connections to the school uh, community. In one of our um, listen to it uh, conversations uh, focused on how Latinx individuals can see themselves as individuals with conscientiousness um, and use their literacies as a response to uh, issues that affect them. We'll listen to a professor, rapper, teacher who actually wraps his scholarship um, somewhere in um, San Antonio, uh, Texas, and his popular name on Instagram is Max Step. We also use arts based interviews, um, which invite participants to express themselves using arts. And so, for example, uh, self portraits give the participants the opportunity to self -ident identify. Um, so often we have seen research that even if you know this research has tried, the researcher has tried their best not to perpetuate marginalization in just a very whiteness focused and embedded research uh, methodologies and strategies. What has happened very often is that students have been um, you know, have been grouped, say, lumped into um, all of these Black students or all of these uh, immigrant students. And so self-portraits really give students like Magdalene in this um, example um, an opportunity to say who they are from their own mouth, from their own voice. Language silhouettes also are um, another um, tactic that we use that are um, outlines of the human body used to illustrate elements of linguistic makeup. And so culture comes up very often when I use um, this strategy um, and also the connection between language, culture, and definitely you know, belonging. For example, this student in particular says, hey, I am American, but part of my American-ness um, has a lot of Puerto Rican. And so the blue side of this body, so she's, you know, um, He's talking about his head and part of his arm and part of his body um, is Puerto Rican and he feels that the entire body is American. Um, relational maps are about the significance of people, things and places um, who are important in the uh, participant's life. And so this is an example of that when the student talks about belonging, you know, talk about Mexican soccer, Mexico is a country, but then yet school friends that are American friends in the United States and their cousins and family and importance of, a, of singing and dancing. And when you sit down after, you know, to talk to the students, you really go in depth as to what this means to, you know, identity and how basically by sharing this, they're rejecting anything that is marginalizing against um, that part of their uh, background. Life timelines also reveal stories about the present, the past, and the future, and also projections and expectations about the, you know, what's to come. For example, in this, um, you know, in this, uh, I remember in this example, the student talked about here kindergarten having first straight A's, but then after we, you know, we sat down one-on-one, -on -one, they explained to me that, hey, I was in a bilingual class and all my students spoke Spanish and some of them spoke Zapoteco and I was, I felt very comfortable and the teacher understood me. And then they went on to explain the rest of their lives, which was very different in that same school community, but then different circumstances. You can find out a lot from these, uh, from these uh, tools. Photo elicited interviews provide an opportunity to inject a layer of agency, context, culture, and history to the interview process. And so um, participants use disposable cameras to take photographs of people, things, and places that show their identities in the community. And then they're, you know, I interview the students about the photographs so they can share more details uh, about them. Um, what I call, what has been called, I think, Watson and Tilt and others, the in place and active observations are where I follow students in their daily lives at school, at home, in the community. I'm um, really in the, with the hopes to experience what they feel, what they taste, what they hear, what they smell. 
and this is um, one of the sensory ethnography uh, tools that I use, really putting yourself in the body, literally, of the participant to feel what they, what they feel. So I attended community celebrations, as you can see, did home visits, watched soccer games, participated in the school community Easter procession, for example, ate with students, and, you know, what this does is it opens a space for them to um, really tell you who they are in their own terms, in their own language, using their own literacies, you know, and for example, one of the literacies they're using in this picture is cooking, for example. Um, and I want to, you know, talk about the implication for this work. Um, and the major ones really is that the fact that students go from being what I have called them language learners to language rebels, literally, because they've acquired such conscientiousness about what marginalization is, what it looks like, what it feels like to them, and they have a space where they can actually share um, about how they feel about it. So here are some examples. They start understanding, um, you know, marginalization and different types of ways of expression. And so in this example, one student discusses how she wants to become a nurse and not work in the migrant uh, worker field like her dad. Um, and she said, she emphasized that, you know, I wanna be a nurse because my nurses make money and nobody messes with people with money. I'm um, talking about, you know, uh, social mobility. Participants also self proclaim in classroom activities by always naming their foods, cultural activities in class, and also not only use their own languages such as AAVE in Spanish, but then also show interest and even ability in other languages. In this case, the student was learning Japanese I didn't know and came about and said, hey, I want to show you what I know about a different kind of language and starting really owning the fact that knowing different languages, translanguaging, going in between and, you know, um, across different languages and cultures constantly really means that you are smart, you have a beautiful mind and you are open and that you are, you know, qualified. And so this type of work really brings that out in the students. Also expressions and through drawing, um, students are telling their distaste about, you know, a particular racist teacher. They just brought this up on their own during a um, research um, meeting we had. And so there's an element of releasing frustration and allowing oneself the freedom to share about the oppression that they go through in their classrooms. And so the major implications of this work are really that the field of language and literacy must further, I believe, really theorize the link between language, race, and power in their schools. Um, there should be more collaboration between critical scholars and practitioners. And then pedagogies used in schools must consider that you know, multilingual um, literacies con constitute a door for identity-related expression and self-advocacy. So because of time, I couldn't really go into uh, teaching and service activities, which I just want to, to um, say that they are very much um, connected to this kind of work. It's a big cycle for me, going from teaching, from learning, from you know, doing service in the community, professionally in professional communities, but and also in my classroom and in the research field. Um, but I really wanted to um, conclude by saying that you know, something important to me that this work culminates into one fact that I've learned over time, that designing inclusive research, interrogating language philosophies in schools, and connecting students' backgrounds are really key to pushing back against the racial and language discrimination of culturally and linguistically monetarized groups in school communities. Um, it's sad to say that, you know, I've done this work in the United States and in other places um, in the world, which I'd like to explain on that, you know, at a different time. But during those um, experiences, I realized that this is not only a United States issue. Um, and so this is where I'll stop for today. Um, you know, looking forward to discussing more with you in the future, but we have a few minutes, I think, for questions right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course. Yes, lovely. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yes. Feel free to put questions in the chat. And at the end of both of the other, the next two presentations, we'll continue to engage in um, the work that Maji is doing. So our next presenter, thank you very much, Dr. Fall. Um, our next presenter is uh, Quanisha Charles. Quanisha? Okay. All right. So I think everyone can see my screen. So today I'm going to talk about support systems for first-generation African-American doctoral students in world language programs. I think this is a uh, 
a very needed discussion. Um, as a first generation student, typically we have to navigate um, academia on our own without having family to support us because we are the first to graduate from college. Um, and world language programs is kind of like an emerging program that not many people are aware of or have access to, particularly within the US, um, particularly African-Americans. Um, so this is uh, something that I wanna touch upon. Um, my name is Dr. Quinesha Charles. I'm an associate professor of English at North Central College. If you would like to reach out to me, um, email is best. The objectives for today are to reflect on my experience as a first-generation African-American enrolled in the world language program at a predominantly white institution. Um, this is not meant to homogenize the experiences of all first-generation African-American students, but it is meant to highlight snapshots of some challenges that I faced as a doctoral student and outline support systems that can serve as a resource for world language educators and staff to better serve first-generation African-Americans. Um, so the contacts, predominantly white institute within a USD, these are institutions of higher learning that account for 50% um, 50 50 or greater of uh, a white student body. Uh, within my case, uh, it was 76% white and 12% black or African American. Um, so that meant that, you know, we had fewer access to resources fewer faculty who can probably truly understand where we're coming from, our linguistic practices, ways in which we navigate society and things of that nature. Um, additionally, the TESOL program that I was in, TESOL is kind of like a more generalized field already. Usually when we think about English, we usually go directly to literature. Um, and then after literature, we start thinking about grammar and writing. Um, so within the US, when I tell people I have a background in TESOL, I'm always having to go further and say what TESOL is. Um, and we know that TESOL is very diverse. Um, internationally, linguistic, linguistically, and culturally, TESOL is a very diverse field. Um, but I'm always having to explain that because it's still emerging, not many people are aware of it. Um, within my particular context, there were few domestic students um, and even fewer domestic students of color. Um, so when I was in the program, it was pretty much many students from an international background who were trying to navigate the US system as well. Um, so, you know, it was a very unique uh, context. Um, so some challenges that I noticed as an African-American student, particularly first generation, um, I'm gonna touch, up, touch upon three here. So one is belonging. Um, so African-American language has been, is highly steeped in um, US cultural context um, and language education programs. However, in world language programs, that was not the case. So a lot of the literature that was assigned was predominantly from white scholars or Asian scholars. So I never saw myself represented in any of the literature. Um, so when I would theorize things, I'm always grappling or theorizing with scholars who are um, coming from a particular context that is outside of the US or with white scholars that are considered dominant discourses. Um, so I never really saw individuals who represented me um, or my background in the literature. Um, and we know, you know, <laughs> within TESO, everybody wants to be represented. So I never, you know, had a sense of belonging when we would go through this, the scholarship or have discussions. Um, there was typically a holistic view of native speakers, um, Americans, um, African Americans. Um, you know, <laughs> we all know native speakers are usually theorized as someone who's white. Um, Americans are usually theorized in a particular way. So when, you know, when we would talk about these things, um, <laughs> you know, I had to kind of like keep my native speaker, uh, you know, I do identify as a native speaker, but I had to kind of, you know, like say, okay, just, just listen to all of these negative stories because we would always problematize being an American, problematize being a Westerner, problem, problematize being a native speaker. And then because I was a visible minority, um, you know, I was positioned also as a non-native speaker. So even if I were to say, um, you know, I am a native speaker, then, you know, some may view that as being authentic or, you know, no, not really because this is what a native speaker is. So, um, you know, African-Americans being excluded from academic circles. So when I first joined my cohort, I had this idea that I would, you know, be a part of a team and a community where we would 
thrive, publish, and do all of these great things together. And then I soon realized that I wasn't being invited to publish these things or invited to participate in these things. And I quickly realized if I wanted to succeed, um, I needed to do a lot of things or on my own or actually seek external support outside of um, this institution or outside of the school um, because I just wasn't, you know, uh, invited to these particular circles. Um, so, you know, basically pulling myself up on my bootstraps and just getting along to, you know, to get done. Um, and then I realized that there was a lack of mental support. So there was one to none African-American faculty, alumni, and mentors. I actually had to go outside of the program to find an African-American faculty. Um, so because Tisa was not her background, I had to get her acclimated to Tisa, but she was able to understand my situation as a racialized minority within a predominantly white institution. Um, and then um, we did start, they did, and this is actually from 2013 to 2017, so pre-pandemic. Um, I don't know how much has changed now, but when I was in, when I was um, doing my doctoral studies, you know, they started working on a mentoring program, but it was a very cookie cutter type mentor program. How many publications you need in order to get a tenure track job, what to expect. Um, and so the people who were given the presentations uh, were usually wide and they really didn't touch on um, critical topics like what's it like to navigate a predominantly white institution as a minority? What are some challenges you will face? Um, so they just focused on, you know, dominant things like, you know, you need to publish at least three, you know, three times in top tier journals in order to get a tenure track position. So, you know, the more I would listen, the more I would be like, you know, you know, this is, you know, it, it was just a very cookie cutter way of mentoring. And I felt like I just really didn't have that support that I was looking for. Um, and then there was this hiring of fit faculty to supposedly meet the demands of the program, right? Um, so because of the theory and the scholarship being centered on those who are either white or Asian, then the faculty would mirror that. Right, so there was a lack of um, hiring of African American faculty, so we were kind of being deemed as invisible or not belonging in a world language program because we don't meet the demands. Um, so you know, it, it was an interesting dynamic, um, and I really didn't see things changing. So I had to always go outside of academic circles to find support solidarity and solace, um, getting to know students. Now we know within a TISA organization, one of the, the main six exemplaries for teaching is getting to know students. That's like number one. And um, I truly didn't feel that I was getting that. Um, TISA faculty with little to no experience of how to work effectively with African-Americans. Um, so, you know, and it, <laughs> And, you know, that was kind of like the experience, you know, no one, I was able to relate to faculty, you know, who were American perhaps, but, you know, I had to sit in the privilege of understanding that because I'm American, I just need to be American and be quiet and just be, you know, accept that. So there was a lack of concern centered on the intersectionalities of African Americans of some challenges that we face. Um, concerns of international students tended to take priority. Um, and this was, you know, and so I kind of like hushed myself because I understood that students who were coming in uh, from different countries also needed that support. So I would just sit silently and just, um, you know, accept that, okay, you know, I need to just, you know, let things go, that's it. You know, I really don't have that support. And so, you know, you know, this is how it has to be. Um, so all of these things were challenges that I was facing in a doctoral program as a first generation African American. Um, and, you know, this, even though this is centered at the doctorate level, these are probably some challenges students are facing at the master's level and undergraduate level. So some support systems, implications and applications. I think it would be great to have black indigenous faculty of color who can orient first generation African Americans into world language programs like TESOL, this way um, students don't feel like they do not belong or they feel like they have someone they can go to when they have questions and concerns. Um, Anya found that less than 5% of African-Americans hold college degrees in world languages and are less likely to experience them as a world language choice. I remember growing up, um, you know, English was always the language 
to use, you know, all other languages viewed as, you know, not necessary to thrive. Um, and we all know that being linguistically diverse is a huge asset to um, socioeconomic advancements. Um, pre and post inventory surveys to gauge world language programs and how it will and won't meet the demands of an inclusive program that practices belonging, develop sustainable and accountable solutions with recognition of potential barriers. This is extremely important. When we were going through that phase of reckoning, with particularly within 2020 and the pandemic or whatnot, um, there were many organizations and higher learning institutions coming out with statements on what they're doing. But I'm wondering how is that going now? You know, it seemed like it became more of a Fed, and then it just stopped. Um, so you know, it would be great to see what's going on or where they are now versus what they said before. Um, so Davis and Markin revealed that African Americans were in favor of foreign language studies, but dissatisfied with limited speaking opportunities and the Black experience and the target culture. And I think everyone who's learned another language can um, relate to this, um, particularly when I was in South Korea. Many students were very familiar with um, the written English, but they had limited opportunities to speak. So I was their teacher who they can practice their speaking um, abilities with, um, but I only have them for a short period of times. Um, and even here in the US and um, bilingual education programs or any type of language education programs, students want to feel included. Students want to see their culture represented. So particularly within my classroom, I do set up the classroom in a way to where it looks diverse and very international. And I want to have all my students represented in the classroom. And many African-Americans talked about that. They just did not see themselves represented in the targeted culture. So they kind of feel like, you know, we don't belong here. Um, other implications and applications, outreach initiatives centered on incorporating world language programs like TESO and HBCUs. Usually world language programs are housed in predominantly white institutions. So what this means is that students who are migrating to the US, they are being immersed in two predominantly white institutions and two predominantly white cultures and it's reinforcing this idea of whiteness that was previously, previously talked about by Maji. Um, so some international and PWI partnerships that recognizes the value of HBCUs, African Americans, their heritage and contribution to the English language. Um, beyond music, um, beyond hip hop, beyond um, these sorts of things. Um, so, you know, we want to delve a little bit deeper as a graduate of an HBCU. This is pre pretty much a place for many African Americans to, to go and solidify their identity. Um, so I think partnerships would be great. Um, ongoing research about African Americans and world language programs as a means of determining how to support their advancement in uh, the prof profession, including those tough topics like issues centered on race, linguistic justice, so socioeconomic challenges, and so forth. Scholarships and funds that are earmarked, particularly for African Americans in world language programs. Um, students have to see the value of a world language program. Um, having organizations like the U.S. Department of Education English Language Program visit schools to discuss international options um, as a world language professional and how to participate. So we did have the option when I was coming up in undergraduate to study abroad, but many students just couldn't afford to study abroad. Um, so having some type of scholarships or funds earmarked would be, would make all the difference. So some final takeaways, um, experiential knowledge and critical mentorship. Uh, Weiston certain discussed critical mentorship as someone who can actually work one-on-one -on -one with African-American students um, and you know, highlight those topics, like I said, those controversial topics that discusses race and discusses ways to navigate a predominantly white institute and how to seek um, resources. That's a huge asset to first-generation students when attempting to belong in places like PWIs where they have been historically excluded and world language programs. Mentor programs comprising tangible goals that increases the visibility and inclusivity of African-American linguistic attributes and cultural assets. Um, so exposing other students to the ways in which we language and the ways in which we practice our language so that when students do hear us language, they don't feel like, you know, they're hearing something else. So we always have to think about what the listener is hearing, you know, and that's why we talk about the importance of dialoguing as well. Um, avoid token 
tokenization or the urge to compare groups. An example, if he can do it, you can do it. Or see, we are diverse and inclusive because we have that one Black person or that one African-American student. Um, seek grantsmanship and fellowships that focuses on recruiting African-Americans in world language programs. Again, reach out to HBCUs. I cannot stress that enough. Um, Reevaluate curricula and continue professional development that emphasizes African-American cultures and language practices. Remember to include African-American students, staff, and faculty in these type of professional development and um, curricular opportunities. Uh, I think that's it in light of time. These are my references and I'll take any questions that anyone has. Thank you. Thank you, Ganesha. Thanks a lot. Hey, Piero, are you on and ready? Yes, with some general remarks and then I wanna share my screen with you. But before I do, um, I wanted to talk about the importance of the building discussions in a classroom and the importance of uh, visual texts in doing so. Um, so I wanna ask just as a general question, um, how hard is it to build discussions with beginning uh, English learners? Um, for me, you know, it's like pulling teeth. Does anyone um, have a lot of success with that at first? If anyone wants to answer that question? May I? May I? Yeah. Well, in my experience, um, it works, I think, when we start with ourselves, when they see that the teacher is open to, to share something, because if we just like, uh, just like ask the question, maybe they are like, what? Uh, it's in, in cold. But if, if we start like sharing a little by little uh, who we are, what we do, it's like inviting them that, that the teacher also is sharing something personal and then they feel like open also to perhaps talk and, and share. But I feel it's important that it's us who start and, and then they can see on us um, a person they can trust and, and that they are in a safe environment to, to share what, what they need to discuss. I mean, and then and they need to get the message that they will be heard and we are not there to uh, to judge them or to anything. So they need to feel that openness from the teacher, I think. That's what I, what works for me, at least. I totally agree. Yeah, that's that's very true. Although I, I may not be as an interesting a person as you. And um, sometimes our uh, high school students tend to see us as, um, you know, uh, symbols, and um, they're not that interested in learning about us. So I found one shortcut, one real easy way to build discussions is to tap into something all our students need. All our students are completely visual. They're attached to their screens. They watch TikTok or YouTube videos eight hours a day. They're always on their screens. And so what do they do with their screens? So they're not, you know, it, it could be anything. They, they, you know, they, they watch machines fall apart. They watch disasters, they watch dogs, they watch all kinds of things. It really doesn't matter what they're watching. What they really care about is talking about what they watch. They wanna share with their friends what they've seen. So if we can tap into this, this visual aspect of, of learning, or what's called the visual text, we can get good, rich discussions started real quickly because kids are used to it. They know what to do. So I wanted to suggest, um, first of all, as a general pattern, how I build these discussions and then uh, uh, bring um, um, the, the African-American context into it. Um, let me show you. Um, my slides. Here. I wanted to stress out, uh, stress the beginning uh, here at, as a visual text. And here's one of my favorite, like first day discussions with students. Now, what I do is, I mean, there's all kinds of visual texts. I like to use paintings, and I like to use, I like to be, build a really uniform set of particular, so kids learn how to look at something and talk about something. So I usually focus on uh, a particular artist. Um, one artist I like to focus on is Norman Rockwell, and it's really pertinent to our discussion today for many reasons. But anyway, just to, uh, to, to build this out a little bit. Um, so what I say to kids, you know, is what do you notice in this picture? What, what's happened? What's going on? And, uh, you know, everybody knows what to say. You know, uh, she's got a black eye. She's, you know, well, what else do you notice about this picture? Anybody? What's happened here? Feel free to jump in. Mm, she's Please. been taken. Yes, please, Alicia. She's going to the principal's office. Exactly. Very good. Yes. 
Why? It looks like she won a fight because she's smiling. Perfect. So you're, you're ahead of my students. So it's usually it's step by step. I, I say um, she's been in a fight. You can see her clothes are all, you know, messy. And, and then I ask, why is she smiling? She has a black eye. Why is she smiling? Then some one or two students will say she won. Okay, so you can build a conversation around that and then you can get more uh, intricate You can talk about the guy in the background. Who is that? That's the principal. What's he feeling? I like to focus on emotion. Um, narrative painting that focuses on the moment of something is happening, like in a Caravaggio or a lot of Baroque painting will, will focus on a particular moment. Uh, Rockwell does that too. It makes, it makes you kind of like animate a picture in your own mind. What are people thinking? What are they saying? So I ask kids to focus on emotion. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so Rockwell is not, doesn't have a good reputation as artist. He's known as an illustrator. He's very popular. Um, but one of the reasons that Rockwell's reputation is, is kind of low, apart from being a realist painter in, in, in a time of abstraction, is that he paints a very white America for a very long time. Um, it's kind of a disney version of America, of small town America, you know, where everybody knows each other, where everybody, where, where kids get in trouble, but they don't really do anything wrong. Everybody is at the same economic level and everybody behaves culturally the same. So if we can look at this picture uh, as an example of that, I asked my kids, what's happening in this picture? Um, what's happening? Or I'd say, why is the boy scowling? Why is he angry? Anybody? Nobody. He has responsibility now. Yeah, right. What are what are the boy the other boys doing to him? They are laughing at him. Yes, right. they're mocking him. Yeah, they're making fun of him. They probably know him, right? He's probably one of their friends. He's all dressed up. Maybe he's going to church or he has to take care of his baby sister. He's got a bottle in his pocket. He's wearing really nice clothes. The main thing, though, is he's going one way. The other kids are going to play baseball. They're going to go have fun. So the, the assumption in this picture is everybody can read this picture knowing that baseball is a national pastime. Everybody plays baseball. Boys all love baseball. You know, so it's very white. It's very, like, very Amer uh, American. And um, we can use this because Rockwell does gradually uh, 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 incorporate other cultures into his painting but we can use this to build discussion so for example here here I'll, I'll, we'll look at this picture um, so he, he in this picture what's what is the problem so if we take a look at this picture real quickly 1949 you'll see <clears throat> Again, this is kind of a, a neighborhood. Everybody is in the same economic class. They're almost all white, right? Yeah, there, there is it, a dog in the middle of the street. Good, right? But there's so everybody a is staring at the dog. dog. Yeah, yeah, the, the dog's in the way. The truck can't move. So the drug's kind of an impediment. And then we have a couple of African-American children in 1949. So uh, relatively early in, in, in the, the civil rights era, um, Rockwell's beginning to incorporate the idea that we need to include these people are not invisible, but still mostly, you know, very white. Um, but then we get to some of his pictures begin to um, look at racism and biases. So here, let's take another picture, for example. Here we have a moving van. What's happening in this picture? Well, I think they're move. They're they are um, moving in a neighborhood that may not be very acceptance of them. Yeah, they're integrating, right? If they're integrating a neighborhood. We can assume that that's what's happening. That yes. um, the boy and the girl are moving into the neighborhood, and that the 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 children of the neighborhood have come to check them out. Um, and there's a couple things you want to notice. Well, <laughs> look at the dog. The dog is kind of rearing back, he's, he's afraid. Um, two of the children, they're leaning forward. One of the children is leaning back. So we can see in this picture, kind of early like presentiment of, of the problem of 
integration. But one thing we want to notice is again, baseball is the common denominator. Yeah. This assumes that these children deserve to integrate the neighborhood because they have a middle class culture, right? Like they have a nice couch, they have a lamp, uh, the dress, you know, in a, in the same as the other children, and the boys all play baseball. So that it's a, it's a very middle class assumption that, you know, um, everybody plays the same games, everybody is the same. Okay. Um, and that's a, a moment when we can start to uh, um, ask children to, this, to, to determine whether this is true or not. Um, in, in their neighborhoods, are their neighborhoods integrated? Does this happen? For the most part, no. We know that, you know, that, that um, schools especially are not integrated at all, and schools I teach are not, and we could just ask the kids to look around. Now, I teach in, I've been teaching principally in Hispanic neighborhoods, although right now I'm in Bosnia, but um, they, they see um, this, they know that the neighborhoods are terribly segregated. So we can talk about that, looking at this picture. Why is it that schools are segregated? What's happening? Are schools the same in all the neighborhoods? We can talk, start a discussion based on this picture. I wanna move along because I only have a few minutes. So um, another thing we can do with uh, Rockwell, now Rockwell is an iconic painter. You see his, his pictures all over the place and a lot of advertisements pay off play off of this picture. So people kind of know these pictures semi-consciously. They know some of these works. They've seen them before. And we can play with that. For example, this work is quite famous. This is, um, you may have seen this work. So what's happening in this picture? I ask kids, you know, and, and they eventually come up with the idea that the boys run away from home. But one thing I really want to focus on is, what do you feel when you look at the policeman? How do you feel about him? What's your what? What is? How does the boy feel about the policeman? Right, looking at the policeman, he's got this big, broad back. He is carrying a gun, but he's leaning down really sympathetically to the boy. He looks like he's listening to him. He's empathetic, so we get that when we're talking with the kids. Um, um, we talk about the counterman and how he's smiling. So they're implicit in their conversations. They all share this idea that one time, you know, I, I ran away from home or I wanted to run away from home. It's a good topic to, to, to talk about with, with children. But um, what's interesting is that this iconic painting has been paradised this way. So then I, 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 I ask kids to compare. Uh, comparison is really a rich way of looking at what's happened in the last 70 years in America, right? Um, so this painting, I think, comes from the early 50s. And this, you know, <laughs> comes in summer of 2021, I think. Uh, during the George Floyd protest, somebody decided to, to make this picture. More guns, probably. Was that? More guns in the picture. Yeah, there's a machine gun down at the bottom. The policeman is dressed differently. And we ask them, well, how do you feel about the policeman in this picture? And you ask them why. And sometimes the students will say, well, we can't see his face. Or well, why is he wearing, you know, armor? He's just talking to a little boy. I mean, what's he afraid of? I mean, we talk about the picture and then we can talk about what's happening in the society. Um, why in one picture there there's a policeman who doesn't feel compelled to carry a machine gun and he can everybody's part of the same community and in this picture we can't we don't get that feeling so we it, it allows students to begin to talk about feelings especially in you know um lower income neighborhoods about the police about the police as like a, a, a colonial force, about the police as an imposition and not um, there to serve and protect them, but there to harass and, and demoralize them or whatever. We talk about, we can talk without putting anyone on the spot about what's happened to them personally. We can talk about what this policeman looks like to them. So this is a way to talk about um, uh, issues of, of police violence and, and um, racial injustice, uh, bring those things up and 
produce them without any sort of text or a, you know preceding statement. We just look at this and the kids will, will respond to it, right? Um, there's quite a few pictures that have a parody uh, that a parody has been done to them. Um, uh, Rockwell uh, in 1944, um, Franklin Roosevelt gave a famous speech called "The Four Freedoms," and um, he painted four pictures about those freedoms: freedom of speech, freedom from want, freedom from fear, and one other. I have two of them here. This is freedom from fear. So, if you look quickly at this picture, this is painted during World War. Uh, two, um, if they look at the newspaper, we're reading about uh, bombings, you know, of, of cities that are horrible. Um, but here we are in America, nobody's bombing us. Our kids are safe. Well, not afraid, right? We're not going to be bombed by the Nazis. And then in this picture, a parody of, of that picture, I can ask the students, well, what's going on here? Um, we can look at the, the children. What's the difference between the children? children are sleeping. In this picture, one of the kids is not sleeping, right? In this picture, the parents are both very attentive and looking at the child. In this picture, what are they looking at? So I asked the students to pick out the details and, and, and talk about what's going on. Let's compare the newspapers. One newspaper says, I can't breathe. The other one talks about the horror of Nazi bombing. Um, so in these um, comparisons, again, students can can go where they feel comfortable going without much, you know, I don't need to plumb or, or pull answers out of them because they're gonna see what they wanna talk about, what they feel comfortable talking about. And, and um, I can then build context. Now, all of this visual work will lead to a text eventually during that lesson. We're gonna sit down in, in a small group and read a text or go through a text. Um, and work together on a text. But kids are very text resistant. So you wanna build discussion before the text to build interest, okay? So if we wanna talk about George Floyd protests historically, we can use this picture to talk about what's going on in America. Um, this is one of uh, Rockwell's most famous paintings. Uh, he did respond to the civil rights movement um, in this painting, quite famous, where, um, Federal marshals are uh, accompanying a little girl who's integrating a white school, right? These federal marshals are here to protect her from racists who throw fruit and write slurs on the wall and you know, all those kind of things. And I ask kids to, to, to look at the girl. How does she feel? What is she feeling during this moment? Is she afraid? Doesn't look particularly afraid, but I ask, you know, I ask the kids to look at that. We don't see the marshals' faces, but they're there to protect her. And then I asked them to compare this to this picture. Um, and particularly when I have, you know, I, I do teach Hispanic students. Um, and I asked them, well, what's the difference? What's happened in, in, in those 70 years? I mean, what, what's going on in this picture? This is a little hard for them um, um, because they don't know the news that well about what happened, uh, when was that, three years ago? It seems like a lot longer. But um, this is, of course, a, a, a detention center for um, uh, immigrant children where they were separated from their parents. And here, the, um, the Border Patrol agents are not there to protect the child. They're there to protect um, or to separate the child from her parents. If you look at the difference between this child and this child, you can ask the children, what, what do you think she's feeling? And this is what's really good about a visual text is you can, from these you can build role, play, role plays. Again, this is not, when you do a role play, it allows for um, real variety, creativity. It allows kids to express themselves without turning to a text. They create the text themselves, right? And so again, because kids are text resistant, if you can do reader's theater or role play, um, you can get them interested in a topic that they would be resistant to if you just, you know, showed them a newspaper article, or you know, even if you just showed them a video about this particular occurrence. Because in a video, they're um, they're not asked enough. You know, I, I use a lot of videos, but when you show a video, um, it's pretty it's a passive experience. You're not asked to do a lot of thinking. 
Whereas when you're looking at a painting, you're, you've got to make all the connections. This is, uh, well, I think this is actually a photo, but um, um, this is the kind of thing that I, 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 uh, I use to talk about what's, what's happening uh, in the Hispanic neighborhoods, in the, in the black neighborhoods, the kind of uh, implicit racism that we see in, in, the, um, in the exclusion of um, um, minorities the early works of Rockwell and the, um, the way that later artists have been able to play off of that exclusion. Um, and this is a real rich way of building a discussion. Okay, I think um, I've taken up more time than I was supposed to. Uh, I wanted to leave uh, a few minutes for questions and answers. So um, anyone, let me get back to Thank you so much. This has been an absolutely amazing presentation. Um, wow, three amazing presentations. So we have about five more minutes in this hour long session. And so this is our time to engage the uh, presenters. So if you have questions for Piero, Maji or Juanisha, this is, this is the time we have five minutes to engage. Feel free to either put the question or comment in the chat or um, I think we're fine with you just asking your questions and unmuting, unmuting yourselves and asking your questions. Well, there's, yes. I wanted to ask um, Piero, yeah. uh, what, what do you teach? Are, do you teach TESOL also? I'm a, a teaching so right now I'm on an English language fellowship here in Boston. Um, so I've been teaching TESOL. I've taught TESOL in the past. Um, but I've been, for most of my career, an English language development teacher and an English language arts teacher in a bilingual classroom for newcomers. So I feel like I'm teaching TESOL also. But I am teaching TESOL now. I use the same method with my, my TESOL students, uh, with, which include community members and college students. Um, I did want to say, um, I forgot to mention that all of this stuff is public domain. If you look it up, you can find these images on um, uh, wiki comments. So it's quite easy to put together a show if you want to. Thank you. Any other questions? I wanted to ask the um, last speaker, what made you choose Norman Rockwell? I'm sorry if I if you covered that, but I was just curious. What what was what led you to him? I'm a, for a couple of things. I'm a bit of a contrarian, and I you know that Rockwell is is his reputation is, is very low, but also I'm I'm very much a, a lover of uh, the narrative painting tradition of the Baroques, uh, especially in Italy and in in the Dutch masters and. Um, Rockwell seems to have carried that tradition forward into the modern age. And kids love telling stories. They love seeing stories. They love being able to pull, pull things out and master that, that, that craft. It doesn't take very much, but once they learn to do it. So now the reason I chose Rockwell is because his paintings are very similar. He always does the same thing. So you can really train your kids to pick things, that, pick things out. You know, if you use a diversity of different images, they're gonna have to relearn you know, composition and, and, and presentation and all kinds of different things. But with Rockwell, if you're always showing the same kind of art, they'll pick it up real quickly. And not because he's a great artist, but because he does tell, you know, funny stories. And a lot of the stories are about children growing up. And I think kids like to see other kids, you know, when they, when they, when they look up at the screen. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hello, I'm Fatma from Egypt. I would like to thank you so much for your presentation. I just have a simple question. Um, is this suitable only for uh, if I'm a, an ordinary teacher at school, if it's uh, uh, only suitable for like speaking classes and writing? Oh, I use it for, um, um, you start with me, uh, Piero, or did you have a, a is this for everyone? Or? Sorry? 
who who do you address your, your question to? Sorry, I am three. I'm asking. Uh, I think your name is Piero. Or yeah. mm -hmm. um, no, this is suitable for um, beginning uh, English uh, spoken English. It's suitable mm -hmm. for writing. I use it to to, to prep writing. It's suitable for many le different levels. Um, also for you know you get into more complex or advanced English. But I I, chan I, 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 I channel a lot energy into speaking. You can use it to teach the simple present, simple past, adjectives, comparatives, <clears throat> very useful for building basic communicative English, even if you're not going to write. You just you can use it for writing. Yeah, and I think uh, besides or, you can use it in like uh, descriptive uh, writing and so on. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. yeah. It's great. Thank you so much. Dr. Ryan and everyone. So I will try and answer your question, which is how might we incorporate uh, your strategies in TESOL, word language teacher prep, lesson planning? It's a great question. I actually have been working a long time in, you know, in school communities. And by school communities, I really don't only mean um, the school, right, itself within the school walls, but also within the school community where people buy pizza, the, you know, the party store or you know the coffee shop and I think all of those elements are part of teacher preparation right when you I tell my new teachers you are getting ready to go into school but you're really not going to just a school you're going into a community you need to know where the best pizza is in store where is the best tattoo artist where do the kids go to church where's the mosque right where is their temple they go um, for certain days with their families and so in using this community-based, community-oriented um, type of lens and perspective in thinking about our students, I think that's the best way to think about this. It is that whether it's in-service teachers that I train, their superintendents or their you know principals or the actual um, teacher candidates at, in higher ed at my university, I tell them you're going into a community. Your teaching doesn't start or it definitely doesn't finish uh, in your classroom. You need to know what's happening in the cafeteria, what's happening by the bathrooms, and you definitely need to know what happens after the, the students go home. So it's one way of answering the question, not to take too long and go into the details of every strategy, but this is how I think about it. And I think the first way of thinking about incorporating these strategies um, for us who are in higher ed, who are training teachers and who are you know, getting ready to go into schools and those who are already in schools, we wanna think about the big picture someone just said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. students in the middle, and then everything and everyone um, that is involved in their learning and in your teaching, consequently, has to be part of the big ones that you use. And so, yeah, hopefully that thank answers the question. Yes, thank you so much.